Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And Mark Miller is here. Uh, what could go wrong? Can I say something now or no? No! No! Don't talk! No talking <laughs> for you! No, he's, uh, he's going to be talking about some new UI science. Uh, but first, he is involved in my Better Know framework. He doesn't even know it. What? Awesome. So let's roll the music. Art, dude, what do you got? Every once in a while, I bring up the fact that I started this other podcast on the science of low-carb dieting. And uh, I also talked about Keto Festival happening a month from now in, mm-hmm. in New London. We did a Kickstarter. We got funded. And we're having an event. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the fact that Mark Miller and Karen Mangicotti, his wife, who you may know from Monday's fame, or you may not, actually. Yeah. Guys, that was a while ago. Yeah. They were both on an episode of Two Keto Dudes. And that is my better know framework because I want everybody to go to listen to this talking about low carb parenting. And it doesn't just apply to low carb. I mean, it, it's all about the challenges of raising a family when there are different dietary restrictions, you know, among all of the different family members. And so I, you know, Mark was on it. Karen was on it. They were hilarious and also very smart. And uh, we're talking about it. So I think uh, it's a, a good one to listen to. Awesome. Yeah. Also, compile before you ship, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Big safety tip. That's a pro tip. <laughs> All right, Richard, who's talking to us? Grab the comment off of show 1378 from November of 2016, where we talked to one Mark Miller about the science of great UI. And got a lot of great comments on it, but here's one of my favorites, and it definitely references pieces in the show we were talking about. This is from Brent Manners, who says, good show as always, you know. Just good. Yep. It was Mark, so it can only be good. Yeah. (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) The comments about using the Surface Studio in the lowered position were interesting. Because you were Mm. talking about that whole, you know, Star Trek console concept. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. I, I have a Surface Pro 3 hooked up to two external monitors. I have the Surface Pro set up how Carl describes having a small monitor below the main monitor, which is similar to having the Surface Studio in this lowered position. Yeah. I find that most of the time I use the Surface for two purposes monitoring incoming emails and as a place to put windows that I'm working on on, and off with during the day. So Mm. stuff like Chrome, OneNote and so forth. Mm. So I guess this big screens mostly have coding windows on them. Just presuming there, Brett. Right. Uh, When I did the setup, I thought I would be using the surface as a notepad with a pen and OneNote more often, but the cost, and he puts that in quote, of moving the keyboard out of the way seems too high for that. Yeah. And the pen also seemed to be a bit hit and miss on how fast I could start writing. Yep. Mm. I can pick up a normal pen and start writing immediately, and he actually puts a time down, you know, less than around 500 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the surface slash digital pen combination moves into the five plus second range arc of... This is not working. Yeah. Wow. And so I still have a pen and paper handy, which means I have not yet succeeded in going completely digital. Yeah, that sucks. It's interesting that it just takes that hesitation is enough that like you break the flow and that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? You've got it. You've got maybe about a second and a half if you really want to push it. Uh, you know, if you want people to come on board and say, right. okay, yeah, I'll try this. You got about a, maybe a second and a half, but really you should be striving for about 140 milliseconds. Right. If you, 140 milliseconds is essentially the same as grabbing a, a pencil and writing on paper right. from, from our brain's perspective. Yeah. Right? It's got to be that good. Yeah. So you have to be that, that, that's your feedback loop from the time that the pen hits the screen to the time you show the, the, the ink. 140 milliseconds huh? yeah. every time. Let me finish out Brett's comment here. I also thought that I might interact with some apps on the Surface screen, but the resolution issues I have, which really speaks to a bad UI, mm. means that the Surface screen is too small to interact with. I can yeah. see that I have a new mail and I can read it, but if I need to reply, Outlook gets pulled to one of the other screens. Well, that's because Outlook hates you, looks like it hates everybody else. <laughs> Wait, Outlook hates me? <laughs> that explains a lot. Everybody hates you. 65 threads, none of them are for you. <laughs> I don't like that feature in Outlook that just sends my email after I type a couple characters in. <laughs> that automatic. I got to find out how to turn that off. Nice. <laughs> it's there for you. Uh, and Brett continues. Uh, so I decided to try something different and put the surface on the desk where the paper notepad normally sits and use the surface as a digital notepad and use a normal Windows tools to cover my use cases from above. Hmm. 
This setup eliminated the cost of moving the keyboard out of the way. However, I was immediately hit with software UI issues. The first thing I did was start up Outlook and guess where that window appeared? On the surface. Now that you don't want it there, of course, that's where it's there. Right. <laughs> Once again, my expectations in reality are not in agreement. I somehow need to configure the surface screen for one note only and make all other apps go to the external screens. And I'm not sure how to do that. But thanks for the long list of interesting shows over the years. It's interesting that we need better desktop management, especially when you get into multi-screen so that you really have apps that you can demand. That app should appear here. Right. That app should appear there. That right. kind of thing. If we're going to be as efficient as we could be. And I'll tell you, Brett, you know what I ended up doing? No Outlook on the dev machine. I have a separate laptop with the Outlook and the Skype and all that stuff over there because I don't like the interruptions and I couldn't fight with the screens anymore. I just got yeah. fed up with it. So I'm with you. Yep. Too distracting. Yep. Brett, thank you so much for your comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We melt butter on him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very keto-friendly day. Very keto-friendly day. Yes, well... Uh, let's introduce Mark Miller. I don't usually read his bio, but I will this time. Uh, he's a multi-year C-sharp MVP alumnus with strong expertise in decoupled design, plug-in architecture, and great user interfaces. Mark is chief architect of the IDE tools division at Developer Express and is the visionary force behind Code Rush. Mark is a top-ranked speaker at conferences around the world and has been writing software for over three decades. And welcome back, Mr. Miller, officially. I am so glad to be here, Carl. Me too. Me I, too. I am, I'm feeling really good. So I, you're catching me on the aftermath of a recent discovery in the area of UI world. Uh oh, wow. And, and it is, it's something I'm super excited about. It is uh, a, a guideline, a foundational guideline that when I, when, as I see it and describe it and feel it, it gives me a sense of grounding. It's like, okay, this is, this feels like the one. Great. And normally you're so restrained, Mark. I know. I'm kind of surprised it's, to see you this excited. No, very, I'm very out of the ordinary very for you. Very odd, yeah. So not, not what I would expect at all. No. Deal with it, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm here. So I just want to, just to give you some context. So in, so I think we've done like about five UI shows. I sure. feel like over the last, you know, yeah, seven probably. years, something like that. Um, the the last time I had a foundational rule that felt like this was um, the uh, information relevance emphasis rule that says emphasis should match information relevance. Right. I information relevance, and it is it, it's a it's a simple rule. It's a rule that you that applies to many different uh, problems with UI. Uh, and fixes to the UI. And it essentially means the amount of emphasis you give something, which can go from zero, which is essentially background, a, 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 a white or a back, white or black background, all the way up to uh, a great deal of emphasis, um, such as black on white, for example. Uh, and so that's what your emphasis can do, and that should match the importance of what you're trying to convey. So backgrounds are not important, so their emphasis should be zero. Hmm. And um, maybe very important information should have a much stronger emphasis. So that's one of the foundational principles of the, the science of great UI uh, and some of the things that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, over the years, I know I've, I've said things to, to, to both of you. I've said things, you know, like I'm looking for the, the kind of the all-in-one universal formula for for good design and great UI. And uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm not bringing that today, but we get a step closer. Hmm. Um, what is cool about the, uh, I, I want to talk about the, the emphasis matches information relevance before I get in the, into the, the new discovery guideline um, a bit and talk about why it's important and, and, and why it exists. Mm. It exists because of the way our brains work. Our brains naturally will look at things like contrast, for example, or size, for example, different ways of emphasizing, and will naturally say, oh, that's more important, right? And so sure. what we're really talking about is let's sync up the actual importance of the data we want to present mm. with the way our minds are naturally going to be inclined to interpret that particular emphasis. Right. right? Something that sticks out is out of the ordinary. 
in its environment and therefore something that you should pay attention to, at least to see what it is. Right. So you don't want your copyright, for example, to be incredibly large and bold yeah. and the title of your, your thesis or your the title of whatever your document to be very tiny and yes. in light gray. Yes. That would be the opposite of following the guideline. Got it. Right. Because of the way our brains work. So the, the, the new area is in the area, uh, it kind of overlaps two different areas of uh, of, of usability. Um, one is proximity and the other one is path. So I'll explain a little bit about both of these. So path is essentially the, it's the ease of transition from one state or view to another. Okay. Right. It's how do I get from one place to another is the path. Right. And just like a regular path that we take, like if we're hiking, there are a sequence of steps that we might follow to get through those. And those steps might be contained within a, a context. For example, if I'm, if I'm hiking, uh, that's a particular context, right? Sure. I, I, there's a, there's a, uh, it's one foot after the other and, and, and that's the world I'm moving through and there's a trail I'm generally following, mm. right? But if I'm driving in my car, it's a completely different context and my brain's operating in a different part of it and there are different moves that are going on in that. Yeah. So overall in the whole trip to go up to the top of the mountain and have lunch, I might have maybe three or four context shifts as I follow that path to get up there. Okay. So I have context shifts. And then in, the individual steps themselves can have different properties. There can be a, a precision. For example, maybe on that path up the mountain, I've got to cross over a log that's wet and slippery. Yeah. Right? So I've got to walk really across that log attention. and I have to pay attention because King Kong is behind me and it's over a giant <laughs> valley, right? Why would they do that? <laughs> <laughs> this is a state park. You yeah, would not expect that. So I'm crossing, I'm going across that. So that's a different context and it requires a great deal of precision. Yeah. I, and when precision increases, so does cognitive load. Right. Right. And we've talked about this before. When yep. your users have an increase in cognitive load, their situational awareness diminishes. Goes down, yeah. Right? It goes down, which means you don't make great decisions because you don't have all the information. Right. Okay? So one of the properties of, of, of a step is its precision. Uh, another one is its length. How long does it take to take that step? Or, and maybe we can also pull that out into path as well, uh, or these c contextually grouped segments of, of steps. And we can say, well, those have a length. How many steps are involved, right? How right. long does it take, right? How far do you have to travel? Right. As an example, if I'm moving my body and climbing up the mountain, I'm moving maybe a mile up as I'm climbing uphill. If I'm driving the car, I'm moving my body, maybe a few meters while I'm driving. Right. My physical motions are small. Right. So step has a, a width or narrowness, right? How pr much precision is required in that step yeah. quality. It has a length property, right? And it also has a steepness. In other words, how much force is required? Hmm. Now, in most UIs that we work with, the amount of force is, is pretty pretty low. Yeah. Right? We're, we're pressing keystrokes. We're clicking on mouse buttons. And generally, with a lot of force is required in a user interface, that user interface is not successful. Well, and just visual cues, right? And visual information, if you're looking at a at an abstract painting, for example, with lots of colors, shapes, and weird things, your brain is trying hard to untangle that versus something that's clean and laid out well, like a UI of a, an application. True. However, in the context of absolutely true, and we can talk about that and go dive in, but in the context of describing a step, when I say steepness or force, I'm not talking about cognitive load. I'm talking okay. about actual physical force required. How much force do you have to do? Now, physical. Though. Yeah, physical force. Right. And so these are the qualities of the, the, if you're talking about the amount of brain power required, that generally is referred to as, as the amount of, uh, as the narrow, narrowness or width, wideness of the path. Oh, so physical force is sort of a non-issue with UI because you're clicking a mouse, whatever. That's what I'm I, saying. Okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Ah. But to address what you're talking about, if we can take a, just a brief segue, when you're talking about looking at something with a lot of different colors, we've seen UIs over the past years that have come in with a lot of different colors for the icons, for example, right? Heck, right. I still know some websites that look like that. Right. I still know some operating systems that have startup screens that have a lot of colors. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it happens sometimes, right? And I'm looking at you, iPhone. 
<laughs> or or windows or like you know many yeah, right. others right so what happens when we see a lot of colors well at first our brains try to figure out what's going on is there meaning with the colors mm. and if there's not meaning if we can't figure it out we're like okay I can't communicate on this channel I'm a little right. bit lost I'll see what else I can find in here yeah. that's not screaming at me to right. maybe try to get information from it's a, it's a, by the way, if you ever, the science of great UI and all of these rules and guidelines are excellent if you ever want to hide or obscure information. You just do the opposite, <laughs> right? You need a list of all the things you need to do. If you don't want people to we're see, prohibited by law. yeah, if you don't want people to see your data, have a very bright, saturated background with lots of patterns in it. And then put the data on it, low contrast, <laughs> tiny font, right? It's very, this, you, you can do these things if we you want We published to. it. It's right there. Right under your nose. So path is the ease of transition mm -hmm. is what it is, right? Okay. And so, and you can think about this in software all the time, right? Let's say we have to print out a document. What's the path? Right. Well, I have to grab the mouse. I have to move it up over the file menu. I have to go down and click print. Mm. I have to then choose my printer or, or whatever, choose, say, okay, on what I want to print out. Or maybe I want to print the current page, make a change. So that's, that's a description of the path. Got it. Right? And the amount of precision required might be one of the things we we um, we note on that path. We might say, oh, you know what? This button is too small. Or this splitter is really too small. Yeah. It takes, it, it takes too much it. precision. You can't grab it. People are missing it all the time. Mm. Right? And so what we want to do in general when we're talking about the ease of transition, in fact, let me take one step back, science of great UI, it's all about efficiency of thought and efficiency of motion, physical right. motion. Right. That's what we're talking about. So all the guidelines fall under that goal. Yeah. Right? So when you're talking about that path and moving along that path, we might say, you know what? There's too much work here or there's too much precision required. Let's make it easier. Let's yes. make printing faster somehow with, right. and easier to get to. So that is path in a nutshell. It's okay. the ease of transition. The second thing that, that that's slightly related or has some overlap is this concept called proximity. Mm-hmm. And I've been running for, I've been running with, with this idea of something called proximity violations for about 12 years. These things kind of have hit me at the beginning. And in addition to, so, so with regard to rules that I find violated all the time in design, in designs that are out there, and it doesn't matter what kind of designs we're talking about. It's could be physical, it could be software, it could be a poster for a school play. It, um, the, 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 the number one violation is in emphasis does not match information relevance. Yeah. Right. But yeah. the number two violation uh, are proximity violations, which is the thing that's so, supposed to be physically close to the other thing is not. It's far away. Right. But doesn't that really depend on context? Like, it's not always the same thing needs to be beside the same thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In fact, so um, in front of me now, I have a, uh, a chart and I've got two axes on the chart and I've got proximity on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, Richard, you'll be happy to know that I have contextual relationship. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And so let's talk about these two uh, axi for a minute. Is that okay. right to say axi? I think it's actually axes. Axes? That's axes. It. That's it, Richard. There we Spelled go. axes, right? A X E S. Yeah, Leave axes. it to the Canadian to straighten us no, out. No, I think he's right. It's axes. He is. Yeah. Speaking of which, Carl, didn't we pick up a case of that, the axes in uh, Da Nang? And Da Nang, yes. <laughs> pretty sure. We, we strapped we it to the back of my donkey. We're good. When we went hunting for goats. You know, there's a cream for that. We got it, though. <laughs> yes. We got that axes cream. And just for the record, there was no goat involved. No <laughs> goats. No. <laughs> There was no goat. All of that will make sense if you listen to Mondays. Yes. But don't, if you did don't not- Don't do that, by the way. Well, yeah. I'll give you a skip button to skip ahead. All right. So proximity, access. That goes from uh, contained, meaning one thing is inside another, all the way up to, a, well, let's just move it up to adjacent is the next one. So I've got two things next to each other. To buffered, there's some white space between it. Okay. Mm -hmm. To apart, it's like near, you know, there's some distance. And then all the way up to distant and potentially obstructed. Right, so ah. so proximity goes from inside all the way out to distant and p potentially obstructed. Okay, that's okay. the vertical axis. On the contextual relationship axis, it goes from uh, starts at equivalent, 
right? Two things are equivalent contextually. Mm -hmm. And it runs all the way out to, well, it goes similar than connected. So similar means they're kind of the same. Connected means a small portion of them is the same. And unrelated is next. And then we go out to opposed, contextually opposed. Right. And these are often task-based. In order to decide this, often task-based. In other words, if I want to edit something like a tweet and there's another feature that destroys that tweet mm. and or maybe publishes it and doesn't let me continue right. editing, right. we might say those are contextually opposed. Oh, sure. Example, right there. Sure. And, and, and just like distant that was very far away had that potentially obstructed aspect quality to it, opposed has a potential consequences aspect to it as well. Hmm. So in other words, we're talking about, look, if I made the wrong step here, um, that if I took, pick the wrong thing, it's so contextually opposite of what I'm trying to do, there might be consequences. Right. Like I have to hit a bunch of buttons, that sort of thing. Okay. Hey, Mark, give us one second here to pay the bills. This episode of .NET Rocks is made possible in part by Windows on the Google Cloud Platform. You may not know this, but the Google Cloud Platform supports Windows Server 2008, 2012, and 2016. It also supports SQL Server versions 2012, 2014, and 2016 standard web and enterprise editions with high availability. You can deploy your ASP.NET Windows apps to Compute Engine or your ASP.NET Core apps to App Engine or Container Engine. That's Google's hosted Kubernetes environment. .NET and .NET Core libraries are there for all 200 plus Google.com and cloud services in NuGet, led by John Skeet of Stack Overflow fame. But what about Visual Studio integration? Oh, it's there. You can use Visual Studio to manage your GCP resources and deploy your existing apps. You get stack driver logging, error reporting, and tracing support for .NET and .NET Core. PowerShell commandlets for GCP, which run on Windows and Linux. And a great set of partners to bring your Windows and .NET workloads to GCP, including Capgemini, Nudesic, and Magenic. So go to gcp.netrocks.com and get your free trial today. Thanks, you're listening to .NET Rocks. We're talking to the one and only Mark Miller about his latest UI discoveries. And I think he's just about to lay it on us here. By the way, when I get myself cloned, you're going to have to say the two and only. <laughs> the two and only. And I'm going to be like, that's right, that's right! <laughs> and one of them has a bounty on it. And we won't tell you which one, you'll just have to shoot them both. Fine. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's what happens. When you lay these out where basically your zero on the y-axis is contained mm. for proximity, right? Yeah. That's the closest distance you can have. It's essentially zero, right? Measuring from the centers of the two objects. And when you look at contextual relationship, equivalent all the way out to opposed and equivalent is zero on the far, on the far left there. So you look at that. What happens is you start seeing that good design and layout does this kind of nice uh, diagonal line right up there, going from the zero, zero axis out into essentially distant and opposed. Okay. And let me give you some examples of this. Okay. Okay. So in Vegas, they've got a lot of elevators, right? In Las Vegas. And I, in, in big cities, they have a lot of ele elevators. But for some reason, I, in Vegas, I seem to be going in the elevators more than anywhere else. They have elevators that go sideways too. Also in Vegas though, in Vegas, big money re resides, you know, depends on them getting you to the right spots. Right. Right. Get, get, get to the casino floor. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed in a number of the, the casino elevators in Vegas is that they put the label for what floor to go to right directly between buttons on either side. Which is dumb. Well, we're talking about proximity, right? So we have the distance between the left and the right is the same. Yeah. So the only way to tell... Is to go all the way to the left and find what comes first, exactly, right? Exactly. Is to stand back, look at the whole diagram and say, ask the, answer the question, are the buttons all on the left of the labels mm. or are they on the right? Mm. Once I answer that question, then my eyes go back to the label I was looking at and then I go in the correct direction. Right. Right. It's, it's absolutely wrong. And it's a problem that can be solved if you move the button adjacent to the label. Right. Just give it a little space between the sets of labels and buttons. Exactly. And by the way, we got to get this in by the end. There is another extension of this guideline 
that that gets us to the closest I've ever seen to a law in these UI guidelines that I want to make sure you remind me of that we hit before the very end of this. Okay. So I'll, I'll push that out to both you guys, and, right. and, I, and I think I'll be able to get it too. So we move the buttons a little closer, and if you can visualize this in your head, oh, of course, the label's right next to the button. I know exactly which one to, to press. Whereas in the first example, it was right between. I wasn't sure. But what if we what if we looked at the contextual relationship, right? We're talking about a, a label that says like 30, 30th floor, and we're talking about a button that takes me to the 30th floor. Right. Right. I would make the argument that those are contextually equivalent. And that what should really be happen is, since we're talking about the diagonal line, is that the label should be inside the button. Right. Inside. Yes. The button should say 30. Right. Then there's no question at all. That's right. right. And if I want to go to the casino, I hit the button that's labeled casino. So we're talking about really good UI. There is, in terms of proximity, we're saying that's a good solution to it. Right? Right. Makes sense? Inside is good. Yeah. Inside good. Inside is good. You know, one observation I just made here is that we're, you know, if you've done any work with UI, the text always goes inside of a button, right? On, on software. That's just the way it works. We would sure. never do that. We would never say, hey, press this round button with nothing on it right here next to a, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're, in general, you're, you're right. You only see this when you, you generally see this, you see this in hardware, in elevators for sure. And I think the, the, the idea is they're trying to cut costs. And so in the past, somebody said, well, here's an elevator that drills holes and puts labels down mm. and that's it. They never really thought much to do good design. And there are, are a handful of elevator manufacturers. And, and the thing is, is you're not selling your elevator based on usability. Yeah. You're selling it based on probably cost or, right. and or speed, elevator speed. That's what yeah, you're yeah. trying to sell. Yeah. All right, so that's that's at your origin point, the 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 label inside the button. Yeah. The next contextual relationship as we move away from equivalent is similar. Okay. And a good example of this is uh, you see this in uh, office applications where you see cut, copy, and paste right. buttons adjacent to each other. Yeah. Those are clearly contextually similar operations. Right. And they're adjacent to each other. Hmm. So we're building that diagonal line as we go up. Hmm. The next the next piece over in terms of contextual relationship is connected. And uh, my favorite example for this are paragraphs of text, hmm. right? Hmm. Uh, imagine three paragraphs of text, right? Um, those are connected pieces of information, sure. right? They're not equivalent. Um, uh, they're not similar. It's not saying the same thing over and over again. Right. They're connected. Right. And, um, and that lines up to the buffered uh, uh, proximity. Oh, meaning sure. that there's space between them. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. And when you look at those, when you look at those paragraphs of text, they look like kind of, if you step back enough, they look like kind of blocks of, of you know, of symbols, of information with separations between them. Right. So connected should be buffered. Right. And then you have unrelated. And uh, I have an example of this that I encountered on, at the Delta Airlines website where I... I was booking a family vacation and uh, the Miller Mangicotti family is vast and large. And so I had just filled in <laughs> information for six different people, frequent right. flyer numbers, names, all kinds of stuff. Right. And I'm right on the, the cusp of purchasing. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm confronted with two buttons. One says review and purchase and the other says start over. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm pretty sure one of these buttons you do not want to press. You are exactly correct. <laughs> when, when I saw the when I saw the start over, anxiety and a cold sweat. Right. Because <laughs> for some reason, I like to you know challenge myself by you know my I found my mouse drifting over to the button a bit. And, and you know you're always used to clicking the button on the left, and that's where this one was. It and it was, was like on the oh, left. it's on the left, man. It was. That's where I'm going to click. But you know what Delta Airlines did? They put the two buttons as far apart as they could on the screen. Interesting. And they made the review and purchase button red, which generally I think people more uh, at least can yeah brings your eye uh, to it. connect with a call to action. So unrelated, right? Let's keep those apart. Right. Right. Yeah. 
And then opposed. So the best example I have for this, this is actually in something that um, uh, my company Dev Express built for me. So you guys may not know this, but I have to commute to work. And when I commute, um, a lot of uh, bad guys from competing companies try to take me down, you know, while I'm <laughs> getting to work. talking about getting up and going to the bathroom? So... <laughs> <laughs> no, Carl, this is all real. <laughs> so they build me a, uh, a panel for my car, and I've got a, a, a beautiful, big, giant, blue uh, start engine button. Okay. And right next to it, I've got a beautiful, big, blue eject button. <laughs> <laughs> and right underneath both of those, I've got beautiful, big, blue oil and smoke buttons <laughs> for, you know, what I got to do in case, you know, the competition is trying to take me out <laughs> while, I go on, while I'm going to work. <laughs> so the problem with the UI is that is we're talking about path, right? right? It's just as easy to hit any of these four buttons. Some of those buttons have consequences. Sure. Right? What we want to do is we want to redesign the panel. We want to take that big, easy to hit blue eject button. We want to move it far away from me. Right. Right. And we put it under glass with a hammer. We put it under glass with a hammer. And to get to the hammer, you have to lift a hood up. We right. want to Let's face it. When you need an eject button, you really need it. <laughs> you need it. You need it right now. You do. Yeah, you're right. That's that's what the designers told me. <laughs> they were saying that's why we put it closer to you and the start engine button's farther away. So so yeah, but now think about what we're what we kind of like we're like, oh yeah, we kind of know what we need to do here. But what are we doing? We are increasing the path. We're yeah. lengthening, lengthening the path. Right. We're adding steps. We're also making the path more erratic. We are introducing context shifts. Now, not only do you have to hit a button, but now you have to lift up a hood, pick up a hammer, yeah. break some glass. We're talking about doing different things. I've right. also seen buttons, very, very cool buttons that you pull instead of push, right? If you're serious about this, you pull it out instead of pushing it in. Hey, you know what? This explains the language Perl. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I'm here, kids. <laughs> hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah. It's time to press the basement button in the elevator of Mark's brain. Oh? <whistles> okay, never mind. At a point, can you put cavernous <laughs> echoing? <laughs> and then you and Richard's like, Mark, are you here? And you're just echoing. Hello, darling. And you're like, it's empty. Let's go back up. <laughs> Uh, it's actually time to give away a Dev Express D Experience subscription to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, become a UI superhero with Dev Express UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, Dev Express Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. Learn more and download your free 30-day trial at devexpress.com slash superhero. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Martin Kovarik. Yeah. Hi, Richard Martin. Yeah. Golf clap for you, sir. By the way, that product you just gave away includes a product that I work on at DevExpress called Code Rush. Yes, it does. And Code Rush has a feature called Reorder Parameters. Yes. Hmm. And Reorder Parameters does what it sounds like. It reorders the parameters. When we built this feature... Everybody on the team was like, let's bring up a dialogue like everybody else does. And I was like, no, let's do the UI right in the code. Yeah. Because the UI and readjusting those parameters, well, first of all, you already have that model of the code that you're familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. right. You, you're, you're, you're familiar with that and you've seen that. And so by bringing up a dialogue and giving you like a list of parameters, you'd have to change your, your, your model of the code. It's a, it's a context a lot of friction. shift. Right. We can reduce the amount of shifting in the context that we do by moving the user interface right into the code. And so we just simply hit the arrow keys and you actually see the parameters animate and move around and change order. And when that happens, there's an endorphin rush to your brain and you go, ah, oh, I want to do that again. It's well, <laughs> it, it may come from the absence of seeing the dialogue. Yeah, maybe. Right? That's where the endorphin rush may be. The first time you saw it, Carl, you were like freaking out. You Blown said, away. Some, you said yeah. some, some words. It's like, this is playing a video game. Well, anyway, uh, Martin Kovarik just won the D Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from Developer Express, just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NETrocks.com, 
click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But you have to sign up to win. And of course, we ask our guests if you had five grand to spend on technology today, Mark Miller, what would you buy? Oh, geez, you guys always are doing this to me, aren't you? Only each time you're on the show. Yeah. Um, what do I need? Yeah, I don't know. I'm telling you, I think I would buy monitors. Is what I would do. Yes. Right? So right now, I've got a, I've got a really nice. I have a walking desk, and the walking desk is actually, it's got three monitors on it already. Mm. I recently bought a curved monitor for the main centerpiece. Yeah. But I think what I would probably do, but the other sides, I've got like a, a maybe a standard monitor to my right, and I've got my laptop to my left. Yeah. I think I'd buy like maybe uh, two larger curved monitors for those two positions. I think that's You like the do. curve, huh? I do like it. It's like the first time I really liked it. And then later I was like, oh, it, it was like, I didn't notice it anymore. But when I first got it, I was like, I kind of like this. Now I think I want it even curvier. Hmm. Yeah. You know, Dell is now making a 32 inch 8K monitor. 8K? 32 inch 8K. Do you have to have like superhuman eyesight to be able oh, to you read? You can't see a damn thing on it. Yeah. But it's a one way to spend 5,000 bucks because it's $5,000. It's good for everything except text. It's a, th- yeah, it's a 32 <laughs> inch display that's 7680 by 4320. Wow. At 60 hertz. Wow. That's insane. Yeah, that's that is insane. insane. Yeah. I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy to live in a world where I don't have to have that monitor. Yeah. all the time and work with those kinds of you know those kinds of issues yeah I, but you know i love this 43 inch 4k i'd get more of these they take up a lot of room but every it's you know it's 120 dpi every pixel is usable right at 100 percent scale yeah right? yeah i'm a fan i'm a fan i've also thought about stacking up a second level across all yeah. the three mm. that i have and which is it's crazy for a walking desk because the walking desk it's uh, Richard's seen it and Carl has seen it, but this desk slides across the floor. Right, right. So, so if I want to sit, I pull it all the way back and I've got this throne essentially in the back of the room that puts me up near the ceiling because I'm so tall anyway when I walk because I don't want to adjust the, I don't, the height of the desk. Mm. And then I just slide it forward. So already it's insane with the three monitors on it, but I, I kind of want to push it to the next level. I want to get to a new level of insanity. <laughs> and speaking of new levels of insanity, did we actually get to your new discovery? No. So, well, <laughs> so let's go. Well, well, let me just wrap up. I, we were talking about the reordering parameters, right? I want yes. to give that as an example yeah. of proximity matching the contextual relationship. Right. Right. We're tr- we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to lower, uh, we're shorten the path, widen the path, and get things closer to where they should be. Right. Right. That's what we're trying to do. Yes. So the guideline, the new guideline line is proximity needs to match contextual relationship another oh. another way of thinking this you you could add the word contextual and this might make it easier to remember contextual proximity needs to match the contextual relationship so contextual proximity is this contextually close or is this contextually distant i see so the the proximity is all about context in other words things that are close to each other are in the same context things that are far apart are not Yes, exactly. That's and yeah, that's what you wanted to be thinking about. Proximity needs to match contextual relationship. Yeah, and and this is also true in writing, isn't it? Yes. I mean, if you're writing something and you're pr- putting down a list of things to to know about a certain event or a certain thing and you realize, "Oh, this sentence right here should go in this paragraph where I was talking about that in yes. that context. Yes. You want to move things close to each other that are you have the same context. Yes. Well, you know the example I gave about buffered uh, buffering, yeah. right, with the three paragraphs? Well, if you actually think about the paragraph and you go in, what's happening? I've got sentences that are buffered right. as well between them. And if you go into the sentences, I have words that are buffered. Yes. Right? The, the symbols for the words are next to each other. This yeah. is naturally happening with writing because this has evolved to essentially what everybody has found easy easiest to work with. Yeah. But there were no guidelines at the beginning that said, here's how we got to do it. Here's how you got to build it. But you can't argue with it. That's the way it is. Right. So the guideline now, this, this, this guideline that comes in that says proximity should match contextual relationship. That's what I'm calling my number two guideline. Number one wow. is, is emphasis matches information relevance. Yeah. Now I still haven't gotten to the law, but this law is totally related to proximity. Okay. And the law, it's, 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 it's hard to describe it, using only audio. Okay. You really need to see the visuals on this. But it goes like this. 
it goes like this. Related element proximity, right? So the, the distance between related elements. And let's go to that elevator example, right? Okay, sure. Let's say that instead of moving the buttons closer to the labels that they were representing, we move them closer to the other labels. Do you oh, see what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. Right? Now you're really confusing yes. people. Yes. Related element proximity must be less than unrelated element proximity. Yes. This is hmm. the law. Yes. I want to call this Miller's Law almost, but that might be a little too pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, but, okay. But you cannot, I've, you, it is incredibly difficult to violate this That's law right. yeah. and still have good UI. I just, I'm not seeing it. Right. Right. I, I am having difficulty seeing it. And I, every time I do it, I see examples that it's it's broken. And it doesn't just apply to user interfaces and software. This is a design principle, isn't it? Yes. This is everything. This is everything you want when you want to communicate. And not only does it does it apply to everything you want to communicate visually, it also applies to everything you want to communicate using only audio. And it also applies to everything you want to communicate using time, right? For example, it can be a time through an interaction in an interface, or it can be time in a podcast, hmm. time in a movie. It can be time in an animation, uh, uh, an animatronic presentation. Time in a joke. Sure. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yes. Is there such things as jokes? I don't know. I've never heard. Hmm. Of one. I've never heard one. Never there certainly never spoken one. What the what? You what? should listen to Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really what we're going to take away from this show? No, but actually? seriously, timing and humor, timing and art. Yes, yes. Well, Timing and music. Think about what happens, right? The punchline is connected to the setup. Yes. But there's always the pause before the punchline. Right, right. right? And some great comedians can actually tell the setup without the, without the punchline necessarily, right. right? They just trail off and they let you fill it in in your own time. And conversely, you can also tell a joke by just telling the punchline. What? Most people take the camel into town to get girls. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, guys, can I promote my, my course? Yeah, that please just, do. So, there's the Science of Great UI, which is the foundational course. That's available at deviq.com, D-E-V-I-Q.com. Steve Smith. But there is this new course that I'm just now finishing that includes this new information we're talking about. It's my Design Like a Pro course. Cool. So, it takes the foundation of the Science of Great UI and builds on it like crazy. And and these two courses together um, are, if you, if, if you want to uh, significantly increase your power as a designer, uh, as, as somebody who's knowledgeable and knows what to do and how to fix problems, that sort of thing, uh, in designs that you're, you're encountering, if you're a software right. developer or just in, in things that you're seeing or doing, um, this, these two courses are, are great for you. And then I also want to plug CodeRush at devexpress.com. Uh, we've got CodeRush for Roslyn. You, we use these design guidelines as well as we build it, and you can kind of get a sense of what we're doing in terms of wrapping tools around the software developer. Yeah. So this new class is also going to be in DevIQ? Yes, also at DevIQ. So That's it's, cool. it's designed like a pro. And if you didn't know, if you haven't been following Mark Miller on .NET Rocks, you don't know how long it took him to do this hours and hours and hours of research and work to do your Science of Great UI video. Yeah. Well, I've been researching for about 13, 14 years. It's not just a video. It's not just a training video. I mean, it's a it's a production. It's something that you would pay for at, uh, you know, Netflix or Amazon. You're right. We should talk to them. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, there's a lot of work that's in the course. In fact, some of the things that are in the Design Like a Pro course were things that I couldn't fit in to the Science of Great UI uh, due to timing constraints. So, so with regard to that, yeah, there's a lot of work and effort that, that is, that's in here. Uh, high production value. And again, yeah. I, I take every, every bit of information I, com I communicate. And there, by the way, there are like, I want to say about a thousand animations in the, uh, across the two sets of courses. Right. But every single thing that I, that I strive to communicate, I'm always asking myself, is this the shortest path to understanding right. between, you know, what the, the information the customer needs to learn yeah. and how quickly they can learn it? Well, it's spectacular. And if you haven't seen Thank it, you. go see it. Thank you, sir. Very, yeah, very intense class and going to be hard to match up to with the new one, man. Like that, those are high bars to cross. I think right? I'm, I'm, I'm not bad. I think I'm at least 80, 85%. Now the first one had a lot of, you know, a lot of production inside of it, including mm -hmm. movies that we shot, things like that. But mm -hmm. this one, I, I strongly believe in its value as well. And it's got, uh, it's got very valuable information and it takes things to the next level, grabs more tangible, practical things. Like not only we're we talking about proximity, but we're also talking about borders and spacing and text and wording 
uh, information to mention. A lot of those things are inside of this course. So yeah, there's it's valuable stuff. So I mean, jumping back to your car, I mean, I'm disturbed at these these three different capabilities: the start button, the eject button, and the oil and caltrop button are beside each other and the same design because they represent three very different parts of your driving day. Yep. Yeah. You know, the the start button, you don't actually need to be that convenient because it's something you do before you kind of do anything else. It, it can be a little bit out further out of the way. It needs to be unique. It's a unique task. You only logically press it once in a given execution of a drive. Right. Uh, so that's one thing. The eject button, well, you're no longer driving anymore <laughs> after that. So... I mean, you, you sort of think the Air Force wasn't wrong when they put it between your legs and, and make it yellow and black and big straps. Yeah. So that you kind of like, you, you're already in the right position to kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> actually, actually, Richard, the Dev Express Black, so Black Ops team that designed this, they've given me remote control of the car while I'm flying through it at about Mach 1. There you go. But then, but the oil and caltrops, I mean, this is important because this is something you're doing while you're driving and hopefully with some precision. So it's kind of the thing that's going to need to be near the steering wheel right. and, and not distracting you. Right. You shouldn't need to look at it to trigger The it. broken glass button, the nails button. Right. You know? yeah. So speaking of which, have you noticed that in cars over the last 10 years, the buttons have gotten closer to the steering wheel? Yes. yes. Right? They're on that's the steering right. wheel. We're talking about proximity and we're reducing the physical motion. That's right. what's happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, studying looking at race car steering wheel, especially the F1 steering wheel where the basically the whole drive computer and everything's in that steering wheel. Right. They're much more brightly colored than your typical civilian car. I think they're they're using color more seriously there. I, I, I think part of the challenge you have when you're designing a car is it's not just about the drivability. There's an aesthetic that people don't want their steering wheel to be too busy. And it actually makes the steering wheel harder to use in the sense that because the buttons are all the same shape, got similar symmetry, it's hard to know one from the other by feel. Yeah. And maybe they use more color because at 100 miles an hour, your eyes don't perceive color the right way. Yeah, I, uh, would, yeah. I would argue that that's, that's probably what's going on. And you're more 200 miles an hour, right? Or, you know... Peak speed on an F1 car could be 250. Wow. It's pretty stunning. The crazier thing is thinking about like many of those adjustments they're making at different parts of a given track. I need more traction here. I need less there. Like it's quite stunning, you know, to yeah. think about what those guys are doing. The other thing that's always kind of been interesting to me when I've seen these guys drive, and you can see it if you look at a picture of one of these F1 steering wheels, is that a lot of the controls are dials. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there, yeah. there, there, there are some that are buttons, but there are a lot of them that are just dials. And I'm like, and I, and I don't, I'm not an expert in this, in what the constraints are, right? What are the guiding constraints that lead them to this design? However, I would speculate this, that a dial is much harder to accidentally twist and turn, right. whereas a button is. And so it goes back to those consequences. Also, when we're talking about the path of these, I bet you the dials require more force right, to turn than, the, uh, than like a button would to press, for example, yeah. right? I bet all of this is very stiff. Yeah, uh, that, that, that feels true to me. Well, because, you, you know, F1 cars especially, those guys pull a better part of three Gs laterally in some of those turns. Right, yeah, and you like, don't want that pull to accidentally do the twist when your fingers no, are on. and on much that. less your ability. Your hand's now three times heavier than you thought it was. Right. I've also, I also feel like I've seen when I've seen footage of the drivers that when they do the turn, you see their hand reach up off screen and they turn. It feels like I see the shock of the turn in their arms. In other words, yeah. you, you feel that. It's a lot yeah. of strain and they never, yeah. make, they can't, literally cannot take their hands off the steering wheel. Right. Yeah. Because they won't get them back. Very interesting conditions in which to build good UI. Yeah. It's uh, it and it's it, it's and it, I appreciate you and you've used these metaphors many times, like the the elevator metaphor and so forth. It's just to remind us that this is nothing specific to software. Good design is good design, and and you need to sort of take inspiration where you see it. Yeah. Yep. Although, yeah, admittedly, the F1 example is a bad example in the sense of most of us aren't pulling three Gs in turns, or if you are, it's you know when you plow into a wall. So you're only going to do it once, and what your steering wheel looks like after that is not important. Yeah. <laughs> but this is like yeah, this is super challenging constraints, right? Everything can have a consequence, right? Yes. Right. Every button could have a consequence, life or death, right? But you also need a fast reaction time. 
Hmm. right? It's very, very interesting. That's why they're all in the steering wheel, right? So that the path between the driver and the button is as short as possible. So I got a question for you out of left field. Uh, Name a household appliance in the Miller Mangicotti house that you wish was designed better, that angers you every time you use it. Hmm. Hmm. Or maybe not angers, but bugs you. Hold on. I feel like there's one. You, you know, here's the thing. I'll give you an example, but I modified the interface after it angered me. <laughs> okay. No, wait, I've got it. I've got it. Okay. I've got it. Uh, I've got some light switches in that were in the house that are in the wrong positions. The light switch is close. It's It totally violates the law I talked about. I see. So the one closest to this room is on the other side. The exactly. one closest to that room is on this side. I'm so angry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I, I have changed a few of them, yeah. but the guy who did the the wiring in our house, if you're listening to the show right now, you are an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you're an idiot. Wait, whoever we, you are. We have the electrician on the line right now. You are an idiot. <laughs> oh my God. But you know, the normal goal for an electrician is to pull as little wire as possible. Yeah. Right? Well, that yeah. may be what he was doing, but it's like, it's like, oh, you just switch these over and it's so much more usable. So I have that. I've in the past, I've done things. So the one, I, the example I was going to talk about. Karen has conditioner and she has shampoo in the shower. Yeah. And the bottles are nearly identical. And the text <laughs> that the important text that says whether shampoo it is or conditioner, shampoo or conditioner very light. is light. Yeah. It's small. It's light yeah. gray on a medium blue background. Oh, terrible. Now, when lighting is low in the shower, right, they're indistinguishable. Right. They, it was bugging the crap out of me. Yeah. So I took the end and I said, well, let's do this. We'll cut one notch in, in the bottle that's your first step and two notches in the bottle that's your second step. So conditioner has two notches across the crimped part at the end and your uh, shampoo has one notch. So you can just put your fingers on it and in the dark know which is which. And so that was a fix that I did. I do a number of those kinds of things when I, mm. when I can because I'm like, I do get bugged if it doesn't work well. Well, and I, you know, my eyesight's so poor when I'm not having a glasses on, like in the shower, if it's not for feel and shape, it's really hard to tell one thing from the other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, it, it, it matters. It does matter. And I, and I think that this especially matters with shampoo and, uh, and conditioner because these, and, I, and the reason I say maybe it matters is because I think there are a lot of bottles that do this, that are, they're, they're, they, they're all about branding. That's the big, that's the big, you know, high contrast text item on there. Right. But, but whether it's shampoo or not. Yeah. Oh, you actually want to use it? Yeah. Yeah. No, just, I have the same problem with, and I just may be an idiot, but I have the same problem with, and actually that could be its own show. Mark may be, it's a, <laughs> Mark may be an idiot. Here's the evidence, kids. Mondays.pop.com. There's nice. the evidence. But when I'm in the grocery store and I want to buy um, fabric softener, I feel like, like I'm staring at hundreds of things that right. none of them say fabric softener on them. Right. So believe it or not, that whole uh, paradox of choice thing is now being used in stores. They're finding that they're selling more by reducing the number of choices per yeah. product. Good. Yeah. And it's uh, happening again and again and again. Yeah. You certainly see it showing up, right? Same related UI guideline, use fewer colors. You yeah. The same kind of yeah. thing, right? With fewer colors, we can get a sense of what the meaning is. Right. Then with many colors, we really can't do more than about eight. Mm. I think we talked about this on the last show. Yep, we were talking we about channels. Yeah. It's, it's a great story and just very interesting to do it well. Well, I'm glad you're excited, dude. It's good yeah, stuff. Yeah, me too. I, yeah, when I'm do excited. you expect this video to be out? Uh, I'm expecting this to be out by the time this you guys publish this. Okay. So uh, yeah, two weeks from the recording date is what I'm anticipating. Does that line up with your release? We're coming out mid-June. June. So no. Then June 15th. Mid, I would say it's out. Okay. This thing is, is out. out. Go get it. So go to deviq.com. Deviq.com and go to devexpress.com and check out Code Rush. Yes. Because it's awesome. All right. All right. Especially that little comma that floats when you switch your, the order of the parameters. Oh, that's the best. You're welcome. <laughs> I remember staring at that just in awe of the comma. The, 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 seeing the two parameters switch place, that's fine. I used to it was just the, switch them back and forth and back and forth, back yeah, and forth. Yeah, just to watch that comma just to watch float it. back and forth. Yep. So that just as those things landed, the comma was in the right place. We might not it be improving mad. productivity now that I <laughs> now this later <laughs> user data has come back. I was just switching parameters because it was pretty. Uh -huh. All right, Mark. Thanks a lot. It's thank always great to talk to you, and our listeners feel the same. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks.
Net Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band.